Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome again to a new session of the Simna Seminar course. Um, this is the last uh, seminar before the summer break. So we have been uh, a bit busy last week, but, uh, but today we have another interesting seminar. And we're pleased to have with us uh, Dr. Fernando Salazar. Fernando Salazar is um, Associate Research Professor at CIMNE and Head of the Group on Machine Learning and Civil Engineering. Um, he has uh, experience in, um, in dam safety and engineering consultancy, also in um, data-driven um, models. And uh, among other achievements, he is member of the Technical Committee on Numerical Modeling and Dam Surveillance of the Spanish Committee on Large Dams. Um, Fernando uh, is going to talk us about uh, machine learning and engineering perspective and some applications in combination with numerical modeling. Uh, Fernando, when you want. Okay, thank you, Ignacio, for the introduction. Uh, well, I'm very happy to be here to be part of this series of seminars. And uh, well, the work I'm presenting here today is the result of a cooperation between um, some members of the, the, the group of Team de Madrid, you, many of you may know, and uh, a group is in charge of machine learning and system engineering, and also cooperations with uh, Professor Crookston from Utah State University and Professor Ariar de Ville from uh, University of Colorado. Uh, well, this is the outline of the presentation. Um, first, I will uh, do an introduction and share our thoughts about what is machine learning and what is not, and what is the difference uh, between machine learning and other related terms that sometimes uh, are used uh, as if they were equivalent, but there's some degree of confusion about that. Uh, so we wanted to share our, our view about uh, on, on that topic. And then I will move to the applications and several examples of application of these techniques. Um, I don't know, can you hear me well? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, sorry. Uh, I was saying that some several uh, examples of application and then, well, some conclusions on the exam. So, what is machine learning? That's right before the starting of the seminar, someone said, well, let's see what's this, what is this about and if this is uh, something real or if this is something, uh, the marketing terms, something like that. Well, uh, as I said before, there's not so clear, there is not a, a worldwide uh, agreement on what is machine learning and what can be done with this. And uh, but uh, and we wanted to share our thoughts on this, how we see it, because we had to do this exercise. We are civil engineers with uh, experience in uh, numerical modeling, and we had to learn uh, about machine learning and how to apply it. And I think that uh, this view can be useful for others who may be thinking about using this kind of techniques. So. Well, there is uh, machine learning is one among a lot of different terms that we often hear in, in the media and in the, in the television and in, in, in scientific publication as well. And uh, it's not clear what's the meaning of, of this. Sometimes the, they are used uh, wrongly, let's say. So we're talking about what well, big data, uh, artificial intelligence, but there are also other like, deep learning uh, data lake since th there are different companies that sell solutions based on these technologies, and sometimes they use these terms, uh, let's say, in more uh, in the field of marketing rather than in, from a technical viewpoint, and this results in some, some, some confusion. This is uh, something that we have uh, noticed when we talk to other people in Timne, but also outside Timne, and this is part of the, one of the reasons why some people don't, don't use this kind of, of and well, hopefully we can shed some light on, on, on this, on this uh, topic. Uh, well, what I think that uh, it's clear is that there is a raising a growing interest in the use of these techniques, and in particular in the, uh, in the community of computational mechanics. Uh, in the recent World Congress uh, that you probably know, this is a list of uh, a group of mini symposia uh, related to the use of machine learning are related techniques. You can see here database engineering, deep machine learning methodologies, 
between machine learning based solutions, etc. So there, there is an increasing uh, interest in, in the combined application of these tools uh, with uh, in computational mechanics. And uh, as regards the, the confusion that I mentioned before, this is a, a, an example uh, related to, to actually to this seminar. This is the tweet that was published by the by FIMNE, the FIMNE account to announce this seminar. And you can see here how two hashtags were used, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, I, I'm not sure why what this happened, but uh, uh, I think this is a, a, a proof that there is, well, there's, it's not clear what is the difference between these terms and, and reading terms. And that's why we wanted to start by uh, sharing our, our view on this. Uh, this is in fact something that we had to do before submitting our first paper on the field one of the last debates that we had was, uh, should we use the term machine learning in the title or artificial intelligence? We weren't sure about that. So we checked, we went to the dictionary and we found uh, the definition of machine learning. I, this is something that I wanted to, to share. So what is artificial intelligence according to the dictionary? Well, it's about machines that have some quality of the human mind. So it's about performing some action that is typically done by humans, but instead we replace humans by some machine. Uh, we think that one of the best examples of, of uh, artificial intelligence is a self-driving car. Driving a car is something that is done by humans. If you want it to do, uh, to be done by a machine, what do you need? You need some sensors that detect the, the position and the velocity of other cars. You need some software that, uh, uh, integrates that information and processes that information, then you need some algorithm that uh, decides which action to, to, to make, whether to push the brake or to drive, uh, to turn the wheel. And then you need some system to actually perform that action. So uh, you need a set, a group of different technologies, including software and hardware, with the final goal of performing some specific action that uh, uh, replacing a human. So we, as civil engineers, when we think about artificial intelligence, we may think that it's, it has to do with, with the robot, about something that resembles a human and performs some specific action instead of a human. Uh, what about big data? Many people talk about big data. Uh, many companies sell, sell solutions based on big data. And sometimes they pretend that the very complex problems can be solved with this technology. Well, if we go to the dictionary, uh, big data is about very large sets of data. And the key here is that you need special tools and methods to work with this data. So, well, this is not that, 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 that well, it's simple, it's uh, quite understandable. It's about the size of the data sets that we use. So we as engineers can, be, can think of big data as something that you can manage with Excel, a, a database so large that you can apply access to that. Uh, at the end of the day, in many, many applications of big data, the operations involved, the operations that are done on the data are quite simple. Quite often, uh, all that's done on the data set is just a uh, average or computing standard deviation, etc. So very simple operations that you can do with an Excel sheet. The problem is that the data set is so large that you can, you can even open it, of course. With, and you need specific technologies even to, to handle those data and strategies to, to perform those operations. So, of course, this is a simplification. And uh, if someone uh, with a background in computer science would hear me, probably would disagree. I'm trying to, to simplify to, and to, to, to share our, the overall idea. Uh, all the applications that, that we will show later, uh, let's say that. Uh, have to do with small data. So we didn't have to learn and to apply any big data technologies for solving the problems that we will show later. What about machine learning? Well, if we go to the dictionary, we see the machine learning is, it's about learning from new data. This seems to be the, the key uh, element in the definition. So what is this? What's, what is learning from new data? Well, let me simplify this into our view. Uh, machine learning is, quite similar to some fancy regression. So it's about regression. Not exactly the same, but, but, but has to do a lot with it. And regression is something that 
we as engineers are very familiar with. Uh, we go to the Wikipedia, Wikipedia is about estimating relationships among variables in the system, in particular between some dependent variable and one or more independent variables. So, I mean, of course, this is, uh, everyone has, has been, has had to deal with some cloud of points and wanted to feed some, some, some function to those points and try to identify this relation. So what is the difference between regression and machine learning? Well, let's go to a very, very simple example. Let's assume that we have this, this few points here and some y variable independent, and we want to uh, identify the relation between this x and this y. Uh, one may think of fitting a, a straight line here, uh, since we know the, the mathematical expression of the polynomial, we can write it and we can calculate the, the coefficients. The coefficients that give us the best fit to this data that we have. Um, we can compute it with a simple uh, procedure. Uh, we can say that we are learning the value of the coefficients from the data. This is something that can be said. In fact, if we had a different set of points, then the result of this fitting, the values of these coefficients would be in general different. So we can say that we, can, we are learning from data in regression. So this is not a great uh, innovation machine learning. Well, the point is that in this very, very simple case with just one input and one output, just by looking at the data, we can figure out that the best fit uh, would require the addition of this uh, quadratic term. So we can again write this polynomial and we can again compute or learn the value of the coefficients from the data. The, the point of the difference with machine learning is that in real life, you often uh, face data like this. Uh, and with more than one, you can have a lot, a large number of inputs in your system. So in this case, it's it's not possible just take a look at the data and figure out what is the uh, form of the polynomial or the mathematical expression that best adapts to this data. And here in these settings, when you have, let's say, complex data and in general, a large number of inputs where machine learning techniques and models allows you to generate predictions to understand the behavior of the system and to identify which inputs have a greater, a higher influence on the response of the system. So this is the, 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 the main difference, again, from our viewpoint between uh, conventional regression and machine learning. Now, this is what machine learning can add to the conventional traditional technique. So uh, we can uh, generalize uh, these kind of problems. You have some system of which we have some information partial or limited information. And, but if we have enough data, both corresponding to the inputs or the loads acting on the, on the system and to the response, to response, how the system responded to these loads, then we can apply one of many different algorithms that exist. This is just a few, but there are lots of different potential algorithms that you can use to try to identify this function or try to identify the association between the inputs and this the response of your system. So this is the, the say the, the overall uh, scheme of uh, machine learning. So we can basically summarize or the, 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 the differences. Machine learning models are more flexible than conventional or traditional uh, techniques. They can learn from data in the in the uh, way that we uh, said before, more or less automatically. As they have multiple applications. And in general, this is important. This is something in common with other reduced of the models or meta models. It's the low computational time in general. It's more difficult to interpret. They are more complex than other analytical uh, conventional uh, expressions. And another problem is that it's not familiar to many practitioners. Of course, this is changing, but uh, there's still many people who don't really know what this works how this works and uh, if it, this is really useful or not. So let's go to the application. The first application is a simple one. Uh, some of you, if you're familiar with, with machine learning, you may think this is even a naive application, but uh, it's, it's really, uh, what, in a way, innovative and, and, and useful. We're talking about labyrinth waves, you know, well, in dams, the, 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 the spillways, uh, uh, 
play the role of evacuating the, the flows. And this particular geometry, this particular shape, uh, well, has a non-conventional uh, behavior. You know, this is a, the, this has this shape in, in, in plant view and this, this arc here. So in a speedway, uh, when you design speedway, what you want to know is what is the relation between the incoming hydraulic head and the discharge. So in general, you have a given discharge, uh, a design discharge value, and you want to design your spillway so that you reduce your limit, the, the water level in the upstream part. For simple spillways, you have analytical expressions, but in this particular typology, well, uh, it's not clear what is the general uh, expression that uh, relates the head with the discharge. Of course, this geometry can be uh, parameterized or, or depends on some geometrical parameters, alpha and theta. So uh, in this case, we have our system is the labyrinth wheel. We have our inputs are the hydraulic head and the parameters that define the geometry. And we want to know what is the discharge or the discharge coefficient of the discharge. Here we use neural networks is one of the algorithms that you can. So the conventional way of doing this is by, if you want to, to obtain the optimal design, you can just uh, well, test different geometries. You select some values of the parameters, you build the, the in this case, it were experimental tests, you, you build the, the, the where, and you test them in the laboratory and measure the relation between age, the hydraulic head, and the discharge. Then you can plot these curves. This, uh, this is what was done by our colleague, uh, Professor Crookstone. And once they, ha they had this data, they could fit a polynomial to this data. But due to the, the nature of these curves, I didn't mention, but each of the, the colors correspond to them. Uh, to different geometries, they needed two different polynomials for each of the geometries. So you can see how they fitted one polynomial for this part of the, of the curve and another one for the other part. So they ended up with as many polynomials or twice as polynomials as, as geometries they tested. And this, each of these polynomials applied or they're valid for one specific part of the so this is not useful when you want to optimize or you want to know what would happen with different values of the parameters that were not tested in the, in the laboratory. So what are the limitations of this approach? Well, what happens when you want to optimize, when you want to know what is the best value of uh, alpha or theta for your problem? You would need to try a different geometry, build it, test in the laboratory, and check the results. And what about the interpretation? Of course, you can see here, you know the expression and you know the, the coefficients, but what is the physical meaning of this coefficient? Well, it's, it's quite unclear. I'm mentioning this because many people, and it's partially true that machine learning models are black box. You, you don't know what's happening there. But I want to, to, to highlight here that some conventional approaches, there's also some, well, uh, difficulties for interpreting the, the meaning of the, in other in similar problems, the problem is even more complex. This is a piano key weir. It's similar, but a different geometry. These are the parameters that define this geometry. This is a paper by uh, this, uh, this Nachos and, 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 and colleagues. This is the expression that they suggest to compute these charts as a function of the geometrical parameters. But the full expression of it is, is like this. So, uh, well, I, I can't, I, I don't want to imagine what process, how difficult would have been for them to end up with such complex expression. And of course, I would say that this is also a black box model because although I can see what's inside here, it's impossible to understand what is the effect of each of these parameters on the performance of the spill. But going back to the, our problem, we would like to see if with a neural network, we can have a unique expression, a unique mathematical model to compute this charge for all geometries and for all uh, values of the hydraulic head. And we would like also that expression to be able to interpolate, to have a good estimate of the discharge for all the geometries that for, of which we don't have data. And also if we could analyze the effect of the geometrical parameters on the performance of the system. So we fit the neural network and these are the results for the experimental uh, values. So we have a, a nice fitting around 1% of, of difference. And uh, we can plot these results in another way for each 
geometry. You can see here the comparison between predictions and observations for all the range of variation. But the most important or most interesting uh, result is what happens when we uh, modify the values of, in this case, of the alpha. We have information for alpha 6 and 12. And with, for the same neon network here, we are applying tradition values of intermediate uh, alphas. And we find we have these, these curves here uh, in the middle. So uh, the same for other intermediate values. So with a unique model, a unique expression, we have uh, a good estimate of the discharge for all geometries tested and for all the range of variation of the hydraulic head. Finally, we can also, there are tools and procedures to analyze, in this case, the neural network to compute, in this case, the average effect of age on the discharge coefficient. In this simple example, it, this is something that can be seen in the experiments. There is this up, this maximum here, and then, and then this down. But we have tools for analyzing the neural network and try to and, and, and draw conclusions on the effect to each of the inputs on the response of the system. So yes, we have a unique expression. Yes, we can interpolate with that expression and we can analyze the model for uh, interpretation. Uh, so that's the next example. Uh, in this case, we want to predict the behavior of a dam. Uh, in dam safety, uh, we typically have some behavior model. Uh, this model is uh, fed with information from the measurements that you take from the, from the dam. These measurements correspond to the loads, uh, the hydrostatic load and the temperature mainly, and also the response variable. So you can calibrate your model here. This model can be a numerical model, or it can be a statistical or a machine learning model. Uh, in whatever the nature of the model, this behavior model gives us an estimate of the response response of the system in front of a given combination of loads. So you can plot what would be, what you estimate uh, the, the estimated value of some output uh, variable, and you can compare that estimation with the actual, with the, the real record, and you can make decisions regarding dam safety by comparing the predictions of the model to the, uh, to the actual method. So in this case, our system is the dam, and we have monitoring data both for the loads and for the for the past response of the of the dam. The conventional way of doing this, well, you can do it with the finite element method. I won't uh, comment on the limitations of, of, of the FEM. This is not the topic. Uh, it's hard to to uh, to compute some of the discharge, some of the uh, output variables. But uh, regarding the models based on data, this is the conventional uh, formula. This comes from the 60s, last uh, uh, century. And there was a simple formula. You can see the coefficients and uh, easy to interpret. But it has limitations, mainly because this was uh, uh, proposed for, for only for the deformation of the dam. So you can't apply this to, to leakage and to other response variables, and also because uh, it's quite, uh, you need to define beforehand what, which terms we put in the, in the formula. So we tried different machine learning algorithms and we, not only on the displacement of the dam, but also on leakage and tangential displacements. Uh, well, I will go to, to the details. We, we took a moving average of several uh, inputs, several loads, moving average of the several level on the air temperature, et cetera. We compare these different algorithms and these are the results in terms of accuracy. So you can see here how we have here the HST, the conventional model, and uh, we end up with uh, this result, the boosted regression tree. In this case, we uh, result in the best accuracy, the, the, the higher accuracy, and this is the one that we selected. So we, if we have high accuracy for reproducing the behavior of the dam, then we have and we are more efficient when it comes to detecting anomalies. That's the final goal. We want to detect if something wrong is happening with your dam. So if you are more accurate, you can you can use it. To, you are more efficient in detecting anomalies. But the most interesting point in this analysis is it comes from the analysis of the interpretation of the model. If we compare uh, HST with our model uh, in terms of how they learn the effect of, in this case, the water level, you can see that in both cases, 
for a higher uh, reservoir level, we have a displacement in the downstream direction. And this is something that is what well, you can expect is quite logical. As the water level grows, you have the dam uh, deforms in the downstream direction. So both models equal uh, offer the same results. But what happens if we look at how they learn the effect of, of time? And this is very important. If we look at as the time evolves, this is the, the date. If we look at HST, the result of the interpretation of this model is a constant trend, a constant deformation in downstream direction. So every year for the same load, the dam deforms more to the downstream side. And this is something that from the point of view of a dam owner is a, a, is a concern because this may be due to some, some major anomaly or may even end up in, in some failure. By contrast, if we look at, at our machine learning model, we see that the model interprets the behavior of the dam with this, this non-linear this step at this, at this moment. And then we have a constant stable behavior afterwards. So if the dam owner looks at, at this plot, it's, uh, uh, you can conclude that uh, there's no problem with my dam because it, it's behaving well, you know, in a stable manner. We checked the safety reports uh, and we verified that this is what happened in reality. There was some something like a relocation of the stresses, so some sudden change in time behavior, and after that, the behavior was stable. So the problem here with it, uh, this simple model is that since we are using these terms to reproduce the effect of time, in particular, this linear term is the best that this model can do to try to approximate this step. By contrast, the machine learning model, more flexible, is capable of identifying any nonlinear behavior or uh, just learning from the data. This is the one difference of learning from data. Uh, regression, in regression, do we learn from data, but we are limited to the, to the terms that we put here. But uh, machine learning algorithms automatically uh, can reproduce this kind of nonlinear behavior. So we have more high prediction accuracy so that we can detect anomalies earlier and we have more reliable information uh, by uh, from the analysis of the model well the way i've implemented it, this in a, in a software tool that uh, has some functionalities that, that we are uh, developing in cooperation with some uh, dam owners uh, and international next example of application has to do with again good dams with identification of behavior patterns. Uh, well, this is the same scheme as before. Uh, so as I mentioned before that uh, you typically take some relevant uh, response variables from your dam and the, you analyze them separately and then you put all that information together to make decisions in the dam safety. This is a typical conventional way of doing it. So you need to do as many model evaluations or analysis as relevant outputs you have. Um, and then you need to associate the results with some potential failure or, or phenomenon. Well, here what we do is jointly analyze all or a large number of, of records and try to identify whether the relation between that, those records correspond to safety uh, behavior or to some potential anomaly. In other words, if we, our hypothesis is that there is some relation, some pattern in the deformation in this case in different points of the dam, in, uh, and that is associated to the to the behavior pattern. If if you have a crack here, then there will be some pattern in the deformation that is that will be different from the one you have when you don't have a crack. So our system here is the dam. In this case, we use. Uh, finite element model for, for generating the data because we don't have data corresponding to anomalous behavior. So we have to simulate uh, the, the failures of the, of the anomalies. And the response here, and this is the difference, is not the value of the response variable, but the, some label. So we classify this set of measurements with some label or into one class that can be normal operation or can be uh, some anomaly. So this is a classification problem. We took the Baserka dam as an example. We have information, of, we have monitoring data, but here the monitoring data was used only to calibrate the finite element model. We 
created this finite element model and we calibrated it with the observed monitoring data. Uh, then we applied real uh, loads for this model to generate data corresponding to what we call scenario zero is the reference scenario or the normal or safe operation. And then we define and simulated different types of anomalies that you can see here, this way it's a bit cracks. In this case, uh, for example, it's, it's an opening in the contact between dam and foundation uh, or others are uh, cracks in the dam bar. So we generate a different finite element model for each of these cracks. We compute the response of the, of the dam in that situation, and we created our database. So we have uh, as inputs in this case, we have the, the level and temperature for, this is the real level and temperature for three years of operation. And we have the displacement in 28 stations, both in, in, in both directions for each of the combination of loads and for each of the eight, eight scenarios in total that we have. We have the reference scenario and all seven anomalies. So we assign the label corresponding to the scenario from which the data was obtained. So we have eight different classes in this case. Here we apply another algorithm called random forest. And these are the results of the predicted. The prediction of our model is the class or the, the situation, the model, we have a scenario zero or one of those anomalies. And we can compare them with the observations. Here we can see that we have a, a, a very, very high accuracy. Uh, but this approach has a, a very important limitation. What's the trick here? Well, the trick is that uh, we have defined the anomalies, we have simulated them with the FEM, but in real life, the anomaly that may occur in general will be different to the anomaly that you use to fit your model. And uh, therefore, you, you can't be sure that your model is going to perform so well in real life. In general, the real anomaly would be different to the one uh, you simulated with the pen. Uh, so this is a strong limitation. You should need to be able to correctly define the true anomaly that's going to happen and correctly, accurately reproduce it with the finite element method, but this is quite difficult. So we tried a different approach. It's called one class classification. Here we use support vector machines, another algorithm. In this case, we use only data from the reference scenario, from scenario zero, from normal operation. So this is something that you can apply in any dam. In general, you have monitoring data for a dam corresponding to safe, normal operation. So you provide the algorithm just with this data corresponding to scenario zero, the algorithm is fitted, and then you can present the algorithm to uh, a set of, uh, of measurements corresponding both to scenario zero and to other scenarios, and the algorithm, the model tells you whether that set of measurements is uh, associated to normal operation or to some other anomaly. And this is the result that we have with this model. But you can see how the normal operation is predicted with a relatively high uh, degree of accuracy, but the accuracy of other situations is different. Uh, in particular, we have three uh, anomalies for which we have around 60, 70% of accuracy. We have others with, with close to 90%, and we have two scenarios for which the model perfectly uh, identifies the, the behavior. So the conclusion is that the performance or the effectiveness of this uh, approach depends on the nature of the anomaly. We verified this by looking at uh, this plot. Here we are showing the average difference between each scenario and scenario zero for each device, for each input. You can see here, for example, how scenario 2A is different from scenario zero. So it's a, there's a different uh, between one and two millimeters for a large number of devices. And this is why our model easily identifies or differentiates between scenario zero and this two, scenario 2A. By contrast, uh, scenario four, for example, we can see how the difference is very, it is very, very small. So this means that uh, scenario two, uh, scenario four is very similar to scenario zero. And that is why uh, it's uh, difficult for our model to distinguish between them. 
Another outcome uh, of this uh, kind of models is that you can uh, compute the importance of the each of the inputs on the response of the system. In other words, in this case, uh, it's uh, like saying how useful is each of the devices in identifying the anomalies. So you can classify your devices, your measurements according to that to that relevance, to that importance. And this can be applied, for example, if you want to select which uh, devices which are more relevant, if you want, for example, to, to automatize uh, the measurements, or if you want to increase uh, reading frequency in some of the devices, you can uh, identify here which are more relevant, more useful for detecting anomalies. This is another outcome of this kind of, of methods. So regarding the identification of behavior patterns, it's true that, that this kind of model can do it with this limitation that uh, I mentioned before. Uh, you need to define very well the anomalies and you need to be able to simulate them accurately so that to fit the model. So this has some difficulties in, in practice. And we are working now in combining this classification uh, models with the regression to have a more effective way of, of uh, detecting anomalies. Another uh, application is on uncertainty quantification. This is a topic I, I will, uh, won't go to the details. Uh, if you, uh, but well, uh, you are probably familiar with that. You want to perform some probabilistic analysis. You need, in general, a large number of, of simulations. And there are several approaches to, to overcome that limitation. For example, you can use uh, some efficient sampling strategies like dating hyper field sampling. And at the end, you have to reduce the number of random variables, and you have to reduce the number of scenarios that you consider. Um, as an alternative, you can use one of these machine learning models uh, in this environment, and in others, they are called meta models or low order models. And so you run a low number of simulations of the FEM in this case, you fit a machine learning model to those uh, to that reduce number of simulation, and then you use the meta model without uh, relevant computational cost to enlarge uh, the population. And you can also analyze the meta model to uh, extract information on how the system performs. Uh, in this case, we uh, took a seismic analysis of the dam in two dimensions, and we consider the uncertainty in the value of the jump modules of the concrete. In particular, we define a different value of the jump modules for each element in the mesh. So we have 336 inputs in our model. We run 100 dynamic analysis with uh, 1,000 time steps, and we focus on the maximum displacement at the crest and the maximum stress at the base. So this is our system. We have a lot of inputs. Uh, the, each element of the mesh is, is a different input, and we focus on this, what we call quantities of interest. For a more detailed uh, approach to uncertainty quantification and how to uh, solve this kind of problems, I strongly recommend to check the, the past seminar by Professor Pedro Diez, who, who uh, made a great description on, of this, this problem. So in this case, we have a meta model. This is the result in terms of the mean average percentage error. So we have a, a, a between one and 2% of difference between the prediction, between the, the reduced model and the FEM. But what's more interesting for us in this case is that we can analyze the model again and to, to draw conclusions. In this case, we are showing the importance of the variable or the magnitude of the influence of, it, of each input, in this case, the elements in the mesh on the response of the system. What we see here is that uh, according to the meta model, the most important part area of the dam uh, or the most influential in the maximum displacement and the crest is this area here. These are the most important elements around the neck of, of the dam. This is something that well uh, meets the, the, the engineer knowledge about how dams uh, form, but it's not that obvious to, or to, to know beforehand. Um, and what is interesting to us is that the machine learning model, a black box model that we that learns from the data was capable of correctly identifying this area as the most important when it comes to, to limit the maximum crest displacement. This has uh, potential practical applications. If, for example, you want to increase the, the 
the, the, the safety in, in the event of, a, of, a, of an earthquake, you may want to uh, reinforce this area or verify that this, this area uh, has a, a high uh, strength in this case. If we look at the stress of the, of the dam hill, the most important areas, according to our model, are both the upstream uh, hill and downstream toe. Again, this is in accordance with engineering knowledge, and it's not so, so obvious to, to say beforehand. And again, this is interesting uh, that uh, our machine learning model was capable of learning this from the data that we generated. In fact, if we plot the relation between the strength, the, the jump models of each element in the mesh and the maximum cross displacement, for example, you can see this is the training data and this, you can see how it's quite difficult or I would say impossible to, to, to say what is the, the effect, what is the, the relation between these elements and the, and the displacement. But by interpreting the model, we can uh, do these plots when we can see this effect, accounting for interaction between elements, etc. So this is another uh, insisting, although these are black box models, so that's why many people call them, you can uh, analyze them and draw conclusions on how what's going on behind the data that we have. And this is the final example of application. And this is a recent one. We have this paper that's uh, currently under review. We want to uh, reproduce to the discrete element uh, method, uh, a triaxial test. This is a clay. And uh, we have data from experiments. And we want to reproduce this curve. All these 17 points that we have in this curve, we are imposing the deformation and we are measuring in the laboratory and we are measuring also in the, in the TEM, the stress. So we have a set of uh, parameters in our model. If you're familiar with them, you know that these are the parameters that you have to calibrate to correctly reproduce the material you are uh, dealing with. So the conventional or simple uh, approach is to just to try and error, try to mm, use your knowledge on the material and on the model and modify the parameters, run the model, check the results, and end up with the calibrated parameters. And this, in general, may end up with a high computational time. So our approach here is to use one of these effective sampling strategies, LHS, use, again, a reduced number of simulations of the DEM, and then fit a machine learning model to this reduced number of simulations. And uh, well, as we will see later, we have a proposed and strategy of reducing the radius of variation of the parameter. So at the end, we want to calibrate our parameters. So we, in this case, our model is the D in, in model is our system. Uh, the, our inputs are the then parameters and our outputs are the, the points of this curve. This, this is it. Uh, we have 17 outputs, so we have 17 different uh, machine learning models. These are some results with some uh, First initial test, you can see how, uh, well, it's quite difficult. Here we are have a good result here, but then the, the, the results are very different to those from the laboratory. So it's, it's a, a difficult calibration task, I would say, because of the number of inputs and because of the number of, of, of results of points in the car. So we are taking here the difference of the, the, between the laboratory results and the DEM result as the output of our machine learning model. We have 17 different machine learning models, one for each point in the curve. You can see here the same values of the parameters, different value of the error for each point in the curve. And this is the overall process. We select variables to calibrate. We run a low number of uh, them the simulations. We fit, uh, in this case, it's a random forest model. And uh, well, I will skip this part of the optimization. Let's say that we have an optimized random forest, and then we can run the calibration algorithm to obtain the final parameters. This is the calibration algorithm. We set the, the initial error. We will uh, describe them later, the size of the LHS uh, sample, samples, the maximum number of iterations and, and the weights. You select uh, the, material, the, the parameters of the model that you want to calibrate. You generate a matrix of combinations of parameters with LHS, and then you compute the result of the, the simplified model, the random forest model, for all these combinations of parameters. I remind that this, this calculation is quite fast because uh, well, of the, this simplified model that we are using here. Then we save 
only the combinations of, of values uh, with an error below some threshold. This threshold decreases at each duration. We will see it later uh, with the example. We start with some initial range. This is an example for one of the parameters to calculate, but we have uh, well, a group of them. So we run the meta model, we check the error or the difference between the uh, output of the model and the laboratory results. Then we have see this initial error. So in the second iteration, we reduce the error we have it uh, so that we have a reduced number of uh, admissible values. So the, the, we modify the initial range and we update it so that we only take this range in which the error is within the, the threshold that we define. Then we keep these uh, values and then we run a again LHS to increase the density, we increase the population here, then we reduce the error and reduce the uh, range of variation. This is how the ranges of the different parameters evolve with the iterations. So we are narrowing this, these ranges. And at the end of the process, what we have is we, do is we just take the mean value of these final ranges. And once we have these this, uh, calibrated parameters, we check them and we put them in the DEM model, in the full model, and check the results. So this is what we had in, the, in this example. You can see how we are uh, approximating uh, the uh, experimental results. Uh, the weights that I mentioned before uh, can be used to have uh, more emphasis on one area of the curve or, or the other. Another example with another specimen, different humidity gives us this result. You can enlarge, if you are not happy with this result, you can run more uh, DEM simulations to improve the quality of your meta model. And this is what we did here. First, we ran 200 DEM simulations. We had the result, then we added 50 more simulations and we had a more accurate curve. So this is something that was well, uh, probably optimized, but something that we find interesting to apply because we face this problem quite often that you need to calibrate and you're not sure how, what is the effect of each of the uh, parameters on the results of your, of your model. Uh, again, we can compute the importance of each of the inputs, the importance of each of the parameters on the results. You can see here, for example, this is for three different points in the curve, the first and then the 70th. The jump models is very important in the first part of the curve when you have something like or the, an elastic behavior, uh, but it's, it has a lower relevance for other points. By contrast, for example, the friction coefficient has a low importance uh, in the beginning of the, of the test. And then once the spheres start to, to deform, the, then the friction coefficient is, is much more relevant. This is something that can be computed, can be analyzed from the meta model. Well, this is a summary of the applications I showed. Uh, two types of prediction tasks, regression and classification. You need data and you can check this data either from experiments or from numerical simulations. Different algorithms, depending on the case at hand, the problem at hand, one algorithm or the other can be uh, more uh, efficient. And also, I wanted to mention the, the, the language. In, in many applications, we are using R. R is a specific uh, uh, language uh, and uh, an environment for developing this, uh, this machine learning uh, applications. But uh, we also use Python. And I guess the Python is more, more popular, or you may be more familiar with that. So many of the uh, problems can be solved with, with Python libraries. And uh, well, this is all from regarding the applications. I want to, to just to, to summarize. Machine learning models can be used as reduced order models. There are other types of models, but in general, this is what uh, you can think of them this way. When you have many data, when you have limited information on the physics of the problem, then uh, it can be these models can be useful or when you have limitations of the numerical models, either because of the computational time or because of the degree of detail that you can, maybe sometimes you, you simply can't reach that degree of detail. In those uh, settings, 
machine learning can be uh, used. These models are flexible. You can put a lot of inputs there, and some algorithms are capable of identifying automatically which inputs are relevant, which are not. They are often termed as black box. I would say, say it's a gray box. You can perform, for example, sensitivity analysis on, on, on this kind of meta models. You can compute the variable importance, as we showed before, and you can draw conclusions from this, uh, this uh, analysis. And you can plot the partial dependence uh, of the inputs uh, to the outcome of the system. So I wouldn't say it's a black box. You can analyze this. Some overall ideas. Of course, you need data to use this kind of models. This data may come from monitoring devices, or they can be generated with the with numerical models, as we saw before, or with from experiments from laboratories. You need to have some knowledge on machine learning algorithms, of course, but it is something quite quite easy, I would say. It's not that difficult. It's a lot of information out there. It's important not to extrapolate. This is very relevant. If you remember, we talked about interpolating, not extrapolating, but this is something that applies also to conventional approaches. In this very, very simple example, if you don't have data in this range of the X, you can't be sure if this is the true uh, relation in these two variables. And this happens also in machine learning. So be limited to the range of variation of your data. It's important to control overfitting since these models are very flexible. If you have a data set, it's very important always to separate part of your data and not use it for fitting your model, but only for validating. This is very important. Otherwise, you may have a, a very accurate model, but that uh, that in practice, when you apply it in practice, it's, it's, it's not that accurate. Of course, this has a theoretical background. I didn't talk about it, but it has it. So it's not magic. It's not anything like that. There are lots of free online resources that you may find to solve problems and to find the examples of application. But always, please put your knowledge in, inside. Don't, don't let a, a computer scientist alone with a problem. It's very important to know the, about the physics of the problem they're facing, about the, uh, the, the objective of the problem, etc. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fernando. It was a very nice presentation. Uh, we've got a lot of people today. Um, we have time for short some questions, if anybody. Xavier? Go ahead, Xavier. Ah, yeah. Hi, good morning, uh, Fernando. Uh, congratulations for this very illustrative uh, talk. I'm not familiar with machine learning, although I'm interested in machine learning. And maybe my questions are somehow silly. But I, I wonder to what extent uh, the change of physics of the object that you are analyzing or you are trying to uh, or which you are trying to use your your machine learning algorithms uh, change the physics one example is uh, the right the, the 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 very one that you have used here that the 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 concrete dams right then concrete dams are made of concrete concrete is linear in first stages then when you just want to evaluate three situations so then you want to take the material to limit situations and then you overcome the the linear regime you go to the linear regime and concrete cracks and the physics ruling the cracks for instance is very different from the one uh, from the linear one okay but of course uh, in order to fit your 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 algorithm if you want to fit with uh, numerical simulation, for instance. Of course, if you want to fit with with data, uh, experimental data for that, I mean, that that is almost impossible not to have real failing dams. But if you can just replace them by numerical simulations, which can induce some error too. And anyway, you can have numerical simulations, but then these numerical simulations are very, very expensive if you take them to non-linear behavior. So, is it possible? Is there, is, there, is there any road that considers the possibility to introduce the change of physics, but not in the model, but just making the training stage or the, 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 fitting, the fitting stage um, easy, but that 
in the in the learning machine in the in the uh, learning uh, stage the machine can take into account maybe by indirect ways i don't know that's why i'm asking uh the, the change of physics on the basis of some data or whatever is there something that is being explored or it's it's an open uh, challenge uh, can you well I, I i would think about it for the question i would say no i mean uh, i i can't say that uh, uh, we know all the there are research lines in, in that in sense but as far as we're concerned or as far as we know or as far as we have used these techniques uh, what we have or we can or we can extract from our machine learning model is not different from what we have in this case in the in the finite element model it means that if you want to model non-linearities then you you need to generate non data from non-linear cases or from cracking uh, uh, models otherwise there's no way i mean uh, uh, what's not in the data cannot be learned by any uh, machine learning model so uh, i would say no or as far as i know at least is this in terms of machine machine or ma the learning machine or artificial intelligence so maybe, is there any sort of any other discipline above um, machine learning that can take into account this in real i mean uh, uh, I, as far as i know uh, i would say no as far as i know i'm saying for sure but no, as far as i know okay anyway very, very interesting thank you and very well explained by the way congratulations Thank you, Xavier. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, is there any other question or comment? <clears throat> yeah, Margarita, go ahead. Uh, yes, Fernando, I would like to congratulate you because your explanation is really clear. And uh, from my point of view, it's very interesting that you say, OK, uh, deep learning is really interesting, but it's not necessary to apply to everything. So you really uh, did a real uh, nice uh, classification. Uh, those problems that can be solved with random forest, other with super vector machines, so on, so on, so on. And there is a very nice paper that uh, in the depth uh, neural networks is a common framework of uh, random forests and super vector machines. But I think that is very important to clarify that not it's not necessary the big amount of complex structure of uh, neural networks to uh, exploit, for example, uh, um, parameter tuning. For that reason, I'd really congratulate to you again. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I didn't mention that, but uh, one idea that we have is that in many problems, or at least in, in many of the problems that we face, you can have uh, quite similar results with more than one algorithm. So I wouldn't say that one of the algorithms is the best, uh, uh, not even for, for some specific problem. So each one has uh, differences, but, uh, and of course I, I admit that uh, deep learning has applications maybe from some complex uh, uh, problems, but uh, in many uh, examples of at least of those that we, we Based, uh, you don't need to go that far. I mean, some of these algorithms, or these algorithms are, are enough for having useful results. And that's a, that's a concern to us because, uh, well, as I said before, many people say, well, pff, uh, machine learning, I don't, I don't know what is this about. And some people pretend that this can solve like everything. And that's not our point. No, I mean, we, we verify and we found that it's useful for some problems, but not for everything. But of course, it also has limitations, but it's important to, to highlight them. Thank you, Fernando, again. Uh, is there any short question or comment? Last question or comment? <clears throat> Otherwise, let's close the session. And thank you again, Fernando, for this nice presentation and for the seminar. And see you all uh, in the next session after the summer break. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you, bye.